So we're here to talk about gangs and prisons, and <laughs> <laughs> which sounds pretty intense, doesn't it? When I saw it on the, on the uh, schedule, I thought, well, here we're coming into the Jewish community, and they have me, Kathy Casey, gangs and prisons. And I thought, now that seems out of whack with the rest of the schedule. I wish it was. What? Well, it's funny because um, actually doing this work, and, and the reason why I'm doing the, this work, when I was going to graduate school to get my master's in psychology, um, I needed to get a job to help pay for the tuition, and so I ended up getting a job with the National Institute of Justice in, 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 for the whole country. And they were doing a special project where we, you go into the jails and you interview newly arrested people to find out what drugs they're using because they want each city to, they want to know the drug trends in all the cities. So I went in as a researcher, you know, doing data collection. And I had a team of interviewers. And while I was doing that, and I happened to be on the women's side, interviewing women who had just been arrested, and I had been learning the principles at the same time. And I was sharing the principles with my clients as a psychotherapist when I was doing my internship. But as I'm sitting in the jail waiting for my interviewers to finish up, I'm hearing the women on the phones really upset because of what's going on on the home front about their kids, you know, what's going on, are things being taken care of? I mean, they were really upset, stressed out, crying, and you know, really having a hard time. And all of a sudden it hit me, well, the principals have helped me. They're helping my clients. Maybe it would help them. It just occurred to me. So I, I called up a dear friend of mine, uh, Linda Ramos, who was a colleague and a dear friend. I said, Linda, we need to teach this to inmates in jail. And she said, that's a great idea. So we ended up writing a proposal to the county to, you know, we had to write up a program, we made up a program at a coffee shop. We made it up. And we took the proposal, turned it in, and we got funded to go in and teach the principals. Well, guess what? I freaked out because I'd never taught the principals before. So here we have this program, and Linda and I are like, now what do we do? And so we, we knew about this one woman, her name's Beverly, and we, we included her in the proposal, and we had to call her up because we didn't ask her, we just put her in there hoping, <laughs> hoping she'd be interested. And she lived out of town. So I remember calling her up and I'm like, Beverly, this is Kathy Casey, I don't know if you remember me. And she goes, oh yeah, honey, I remember you. She's an African-American woman. She goes, oh yeah, I remember you. You were that real, real intense white woman that was right up in my face. Because <laughs> I had gone up to her and she, she, she tells the story much better. But anyway, I said, listen, I got this money to teach inmates in prison, teach the principals. And all of a sudden, she started screaming on the other end of the phone. And I'm like, uh-oh, what's wrong? Are you okay? And then she starts crying. And I'm like, what is going on? And then she says, it's been my dream to teach this to women who are incarcerated. How did you know? And you know, I'm getting goosebumps just remembering. And I said, well, yeah, well, I'm, I was just hoping you'd want to, she said, of course I want to do it with you. And I said, well, this is the program, this is how much, you know, you're, you know, what we can pay you. She said, well, you know my fee's a little higher than that. And I said, no problem, I talked to Linda, we gotta move some money over from, you know, from us to her. But anyway, that's how I started teaching. Uh, inmates in jail. I started with the women, but then the commander of the jail said, no, 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 I want the guys too. So all of a sudden, I had men and women, and it was started very small. Word got out, and then they started asking me to go into the units that were the gang units, where there were a lot of fights and a lot of violence. They said, would you be interested in taking this into those units? And I said, when do we start? And believe me, that was an amazing experience to go in to a unit where people can't even be with themselves, let alone other people. 
The tension was very intense. They let them out one hour a day. That's how intense it was. And we, we just started with a small class. And the correction officers, they kind of questioned what we were doing. They didn't like that I was in there because when you bring civilians into a situation like that, the correction officers get very nervous about protecting that, that person. It's like one more thing they have to worry about. Well, over time, and uh, the correction officers, they, they roll their eyes when we came, when I came in. Right? Why would you even bother with these guys? And I would just keep coming. Well, guess what started to happen in that unit? The violence disappeared. Totally disappeared. And the correctional officers came up to me and they said, we need to apologize to you. We thought this was going to be a problem. Not only is it not a problem, we would like to send these other guys that we don't dare let out, could they come to your class? And that's how this, the word just spread. And again, when the inmates hear this, they start having their insights and they start to change. So how hopeful is that, huh? Because guess what? They have families. Just because you lock a person away doesn't mean that, well, you don't have to worry about him anymore or her anymore. No, they're still connected out into the community. And they're still impacting either negatively or positively. And what do you think mostly happens? Negative. It's a negative connection. Keeps you know, generations, there are three, three, four generations of gangs continuing. Sons are looking forward to being in the gang and they're looking forward to going to prison. And I mean, to them, like you would look forward to going to college, kids look forward to going to San Quentin. This is, this is their life, this is their world. It makes sense to them. So when I come in teaching the principles, it breaks that cycle. And, and it's amazing the insights some of these guys have had. Actually, I call them miracles because when you see somebody that violent who's lived a life like that, and they go from that place to a place of peace and calm, they become my teachers. It's almost like they've time jumped me and they've gone to a deeper knowing than even I can imagine. So I've been so inspired by doing this work and it actually helped me do better with the business community because George and Linda Pransky invited me to work with the business community and when I first sat with them I'm sitting there like what do I do with this because they were very intense and talking over each other and just being obnoxious and I'm sitting there like well what do I do with this and then it, really, it dawned on me well you know I work with boys in juvenile hall who are just like this, and I know how to handle those boys. So I just did the same thing with the businessmen. And I, it was like this, uh, guys, guys, all right, everybody. And they looked at me, I said, now we all need to sit down. We're each gonna get a turn to share, you know, each one. And they're looking at me, I said, we're here to listen to each other. And they're kind of like, you know, okay. And so they'd start to behave. But by the fifth guy, they start at it again. And I'm like, okay, now, guys, where did you go? Let's go back. Well, after I finished my group, when I was done, I was like, oh, Lord, I can't believe. They shouldn't have put me in this group because I don't know how to do this. So I come out of the room and the, Dick Bazoin, he's the uh, manager, the, the guy who brought us all in. He says, you're hired, because I just went in to observe. He said, you're hired. I said, hired for what? No, you are hired. That's what it's going to take to get these guys to listen. you got to hit them upside the head. So the, I, what I started to see is there was no difference between the business guys and the inmates. So after a while, I'd be, you know, some, one, one week I'm doing the business guys, another week I'm doing the inmates. So the inmates would say, so how'd the guys do? Because <laughs> they know where I'm going. I go, well, it took me three, about three days to get there because we'd have a five-day program. Yeah, they were a little tough, but they got there. The business guys asked me, so how did the inmates do with this? <laughs> who does better, us or them? <laughs> and then I said, well, who do you think does better? And they go, I bet you the inmates do better. I go, 
<laughs> but do you see the point I'm making is there's underneath our disguises, we're all the same. And that's what I've gotten to see, no matter whether I'm with you all or I'm doing a class in the jail. Yeah, we, we are different, we're in different cultures. That's why when, when, when Rabbi Shaw came and shared at the jail, they immediately questioned him on, well, what's up with the, you know, the stuff hanging out of your jacket? You know, the, the yam, well, what's up with that? And so he did a beautiful job of explaining the symbolism and what it's pointing, pointing in the culture, what it's pointing to. And, and the guys are like, oh, okay, well, that's, that's cool. And then I said, well, how about you guys? What's up with your disguise? You know, your, 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 the names of your gangs and your colors and, and you know, that territory thing. I said, what do, you, what do you make of that? And they go, you know, it's probably the same as this guy. I said, yeah, we're all walking around in our different disguises or our different cultures. But what do we all want? What does everybody want? What does everybody want? To be happy. Peace. To be happy, to have peace of mind. And then from that, what is that, when we have peace of mind, what does that do for those of us around us? They pick it up. See, this is what keeps our families together. This is, this is what it's all about. Well, guess what? They want the same thing. I always ask them, I, I ask them, what is it? What is it that you want the most for, your, for you right now? And they say, peace of mind. And then I said, what's the next thing you want? I want to be a better father and a better husband. And I've let my family down. See, they know. They know. But again, because they're in, this, this, they're in thought and they don't know it, they really don't know it. And when they realize, they get mad at me. They said, well, if I had known this, I wouldn't be sitting here. I said, I know, I didn't know it either. But what I did didn't get me locked up. What you did, did get you locked up. It's the only difference. So here's what I talk about. Separate realities. See, each one of us has our own, like as an individual, you're your own culture. Each one of you, you're within your own Inside, you're, each one of you has your own culture. And even though we may share a culture in general, inside, are we all the same? We operate the same way, but what we create is different for each and every one of us. So that's why it was so powerful. When you get present, you're open to hearing the other person's culture, their little world, instead of assuming. Is that making sense? 100%. So this, so yeah, gangs and, and prisons, I just happened to be in that environment and, and it, it, it dawned on me that, wow, this would be a helpful thing to share with them. But again, it doesn't matter where we are. In fact, there are, there are a couple of inmates, I'll tell you one story. Do you want to hear a story? Yes. Because they're great stories. Um, there was one guy, he, um, young, young man, he was Samoan, Samoan guy. He was going to college, he was going to San Jose State University, and he was a football player, you know, big Samoan guy, football player. And unfortunately, you know, he would go out with his buddies and they would start drinking, you know, do a lot of drinking. And one time he was with his buddies, they were drinking and they ran out of, they ran out of something to drink. And they thought, well, we'll just go hold up one of those little markets or a liquor store. Now, talk about a bizarre thought, right? Well, they, and they're, they're under the influence, so they decide to go rob a liquor store. And unfortunately, somebody had a gun. So they go in and they pull the gun. This guy pulls the gun on the, the manager of the store and says, I, I want, give us the liquor. Unfortunately, the gun went off and kill the man at all the store. Plus it was filmed. He was only 20, 20 years old. Okay. When I, he ended up in my class, now I don't know about what happened. I know nothing why he was in there. I'm just telling you ahead of time, because I found out after. 
he was sitting in my class, and I've never seen anybody that shut down. Really, he was, he was like, shut down. So much so that you could, it, it was almost like I could feel the intensity. He's this big guy, and he shut down. And I'm like, wow, what's up with this guy? So I'm just doing the class, but I could feel him over in the corner. Just, he's there, but he's not there. And I kept wanting to somehow see if I could get connected to him, and nothing was happening. So finally, um, you know, I think, you know, t 10 classes into it, he'd always just stand there, like a statue. All of a sudden, he looked at me, he said, do you mean to tell me my life isn't over? And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, I thought my life was over because he was up for the death penalty. Because he was charged with murder, he was up for the death penalty. I thought my life was all over, and you're telling me my life isn't over? And I said, well, what do you mean? I, I can have a full life in prison? He saw it. He saw he could still have a full life in prison, even if he's on death row. You know what he saw? He had freedom. He saw his thoughts kept him prisoner. It wasn't the prison, it was he had so much thought about what was going on, he just felt like his life was over. So what happened was that his legal team, they saw a change in him. And they're like, what is going on? Because he was going through the sentencing phase of, see, first he was found guilty of murder. Then you go through another, you know, where you have another jury to decide whether you get life without parole or the death penalty. 20 years old. So he kind of becomes alive and his legal team calls me and they said, what happened to him? Because uh, thank goodness uh, we just had a hung jury. One person said he should get life with, without parole. The other 11 wanted him to go to death row. Because it was not unanimous, they had to call a new jury. Had he so that person kept him alive, that one person. So the next jury that was called, he presented in a whole different way. See, the first jury saw, when you look shut down, what did they think? Guilt, how guilt. how do they appreciate? He don't care. He doesn't care, no remorse. See, they saw him like, well, he, we're putting him on death row. Because they didn't realize that he was shut down because he was in such a depression. Well, the next round, because he was reconnected to himself, he was able to make a statement and take responsibility and show his remorse. The next round, it was unanimous that he would do life without the world. So, I'm telling you, he now is in probably one of the worst prisons in California, Pelican Bay, in the shoe. And every now and then I run into his uh, lawyer because he's part of the uh, legal aid group. And I, I said, have you heard from Andrew? How's he doing? It's amazing, Kathy. He's doing great. His family comes to see him all the time. They see, everybody seems to be doing okay. He has a life, even though he's locked up. So the principles gave him his freedom, his, his awareness. And I could tell you 20 more stories just like that. Just like that. Now, absolutely, I don't agree with what he did. You know, he made this horrible mistake. And he's, he has to pay for it. But when people reconnect, he can still now have a positive impact on his family and then beyond his family. So even though he's in prison, he can still impact the world. As Mandela did in South Africa. So to me, it's very hopeful. It's hopeful for people who are locked up. It's hopeful for their families. But guess where it's the most hopeful? For me. See, this keeps me going. Because sometimes I get discouraged. How many of you get discouraged? <laughs> we all get discouraged, don't we? And we get up and like, you know, what's the point? Do I have to do this again? And I get 
so inspired because I could go into that jail not feeling very, you know, and within 10 minutes, it's amazing. We have these amazing dialogues and they share their insights. So I'm so grateful, first of all, that I discovered the principles by, by fluke, by accident, and that I'm able to bring this into those environments. So that's why, to me, this applies to all of us. You know, sometimes we're troubled. Any questions about what I've shared so far? Yes? I'm just, just very curious about what happens when these gang members get you know, they leave prison. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. What happens when some of the gang guys get out? A, a number of things. I'll give you different scenarios. Um, this is a cute story. Uh, one time I was uh, putting gas in my car, and this big, brand new white SUV pulled in with the pulsating music. You know, the pulsating. <laughs> And I'm sitting there like, why do we, have, do you have to impose your music on other people? I'm in this thinking, why do I have to hear your music? And I kind of look over and give the driver kind of a dirty look. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this is Kathy, right? So I'm, fin I'm, you know, waiting for my tank to get filled up. And, um, and again, the, the music got louder because the doors were open. So, and there are two young kids in the band, teenagers, and an older guy in the front. And it's, it's even louder. And I'm, I, if I had it in me, I would go over and they could you please turn your music down? But I knew, I knew not to do that. Well, they, they pulled out. They left before me, and they, they, they pulled out and went by me. And they were leaving the gas station. And all of a sudden, the van stopped, and it started backing up to me again. And I'm like, oh, what did you do, Kevin? You should keep your, you, you know, I always bring stuff on, you know? So I thought, oh, he's going to say something nasty to me. So he, the car pulls up, and all of a sudden I look into the car. You know, he's looking at me, I'm looking at him, and I'm getting ready for him to get on my case. And he said, Kathy, Kathy, it's me, it's me. And I'm like, oh my, you're kidding. I recognized him. He's one of the guys who was in my class. And he says, Kathy, it was like five years ago, right? Kathy, you won't believe it. My life is so much better. I, I left the gang and I started my own business. I have a catering business. Um, I remarried. I have a new baby now. And, and th these are my other sons. And I'm doing so great. And thanks for telling me that thought thing. You have no idea. It changed my life. And I felt so bad because here I was sitting there thinking how annoying he was with the music. I get that kind of experience a lot. I run into some of these guys out on the street, you know, working in Target. Starbucks, I'm at an arts festival in San Jose, and they come up to me and thank me. Then I see guys come back in. Then they're the ones who come back in. But here's what's different. When they come back in, it's cute because first they're like, yeah, Kathy, I'm back. And I said, oh, well, I'm just glad you're, you're okay. He said, yeah, you know, I, now I get what you're saying. I was definitely in all that thought, but I didn't see it. I didn't see, I was in the thoughts. Now, that's different than, yeah, they're just jacking me up again. They're just trying to get me back in jail. No, they take responsibility. I was caught up and I didn't see it. And now they're telling me, you know, I kind of was half listening to your class. Now I want to hear more. And I hear this time and again. So they, some of them come back, absolutely. But they come back different. They see something a little different. And to me, I don't care how many times they come back. Their level of understanding is still going up. It's still going up. And to me, that's what it's all about. Could you tell us some of the points that could give them Yeah, the I'm principle? Oh, I'm what do I tell them? How you communicate. It's your... everything that's been said. Same thing. I have heard a lot about thought, and we haven't heard that much about consciousness and mind. OK. And I'd love to hear how you talk about oh, With them? with anybody really. Oh, okay, okay. Well, see, to me, you know how, you know how we talk about, you know, throughout your day, don't, don't, you, don't you go up and down your feelings. Sometimes you're in a good feeling. Sometimes you're impatient. Sometimes you're, you're thinking ahead and you're worried. Don't you go through that? 
Some days you're cool all day long. Now, we talk about that thought all the time, right? But the only way you can experience your thought is through consciousness. So all we mean by consciousness is it, it's a physical experience of all the stuff going through your mind. So as you go up and down all day long in a feeling, you know, sometimes you feel excited, sometimes you're anticipating, butterflies sometimes you're... Butterflies butterfly, you, you could feel it physically. How many of you get tight in the neck? Okay. Think of, think of your, you know, each person has their own unique feeling. For me, it's in my gut. Is it about the things you see also? Is no, 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 no. It's just thought coming through. So the you could see something. Okay. It's your so you're, 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 so think, you could, you're looking at life. No, no, don't write. Don't write. Stay with me. <laughs> Stay with me. You're missing it. No, I'm not. But, yeah. okay, no, fine. just put the pencil in. <laughs> I want you to get a hit off what I'm saying. I want you to intuitively hear what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, all that's happening is, you're in and out of different feelings, but my flavor is my stomach gets tight. Well, that's thought coming to my stomach through consciousness. Some people, their neck, right? What are other places we feel thought? Back. 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 Heartbeat. Heart, your heart back, you know, you feel headaches. your heart. Headaches. Headaches. What else? Oh, that's, that's another one. Some mornings I wake up and I'm like, whoa, I must have been doing a lot of thinking last night. <laughs> Clench, yeah. What else? You could have smiles. You feel happy. You feel relaxed. Consciousness is giving you that feeling. That's what consciousness is. So if you, remember Mark said you can't have, if you have a positive thought, you can't have a negative feeling. If you have a positive thought, you have to have a positive feeling. But so, the, the good news is, so when my stomach starts to get tight, guess what it's telling me? Oh, Kathy, you're in a lot of thinking. Sometimes I don't know until I feel it. So feelings are just like a barometer that helps you understand what's going on here. Now, you may not even know what the thought is, I just know when my stomach gets tight, oh, you're in too much thinking. Or we start losing things. Remember we yesterday, we missed the exit, or we park, you know, we go into somebody else's car. Consciousness is giving us whatever's in our mind. So if your mind is, you know, ahead, you're not seeing the car in front of you. Do, do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So consciousness is just giving you, so if you start thinking about, oh, I have to get in front of a group and, and give a speech. And I want you all to start thinking about, oh man, I'm going to have to give a, a talk in front of the group. What do you start feeling? <laughs> you start to feel it, don't you? Don't you? That's consciousness. If you start to have a thought, Oh man, my favorite food is at Zabar's. Oh man, I just want to go to Zabar's right now. I can't wait to go to Zabar's. What feeling am I going to have? I'm going to be hungry. I'm going to start to taste the food. Whatever is in there is what you get. That's what consciousness is. That's all it is. Do you mean to say that thinking? Whatever thinking you're having, consciousness gives you a feeling. Pardon me? That's it. If you feel irritable or nervous, then what, what kind of thoughts do you think you're having? Okay. Irritable, irritable thoughts. But see, here's the difference. When I feel irritable, and believe me, sometimes I do, especially like when I'm flying and I'm at the airport and the line isn't moving and I'm like, you know. <laughs> Normal. Mentally, I'm trying to be at the front of the line and it's not moving, sound familiar? Well, I'm gonna get impatience. I'm gonna get a feeling of impatience. Other times, the line's long, and I'm like, hanging out, seeing the little babies running around, and you know, I'm just okay. My mind's free and clear. Other times, my mind is like, when are we gonna get on the plane? I'm in that mode. You're not really choosing your thoughts. No, it just, they just come in. 
Whatever thoughts come in, you will feel them. There's no rhyme or reason to it either. They come in, you feel them, they come in, you feel them, they come in, you feel them, and that's just going on all day long and all night, 24 seven, that's all it is. Very simple. Okay, and mind? Mind is, imagine, imagine if the electricity went out in this, in this room. So what do we need to keep all this going? We need the power. We need to plug into the power. If we didn't have a power source, we would not have lights. We wouldn't have air conditioning. Mind is just the intelligence, the power source, God, whatever you want to call that. It's not the sum of your thoughts. No. You're trying too hard with your head. That's right. Is where your thoughts come from. Just, just be very smell it. We are connected to energy, God, universal intelligence, spirit, whatever you want to call it. Without it, we would not exist. So we're not saying they're all separate. See, to me, thought, if I'm not in thought, where am I? Not alive. I'm not alive. If I'm not in consciousness, where am I? I'm not alive. If I'm not in mind, if I'm not connected to mind, I'm not alive. In this reality. Now, what happens beyond this? I don't know. I've never been there. So I haven't been able to tell, you know, come back and tell you all. <laughs> but in this reality, right here, this is what allows us to be on the planet and have an experience. And it's just whatever we think we feel, whatever we think we feel, and we're plugged into this power source that lets us have all these great experiences. And the more we get hip to that, the more we know that's what's behind the whole thing, that empowers us. Instead of my environments making me feel a certain way, oh, it's my thoughts are making me feel a certain way. Because do thoughts stay the same all the time? No, they're constantly changing. So in your day, don't you, during your day, how, do, do you feel the exact same way all day long? No. You go up, you go down, you go up, you go down. You, you stay up for a while, you go down for a while. Even if people are depressed, if I get in there with them, I say, now, you're saying you're depressed 24-7. Oh yes, I'm depressed 24-7. I said, now, I bet there was three minutes in there that you weren't depressed. And they go, well, I don't know. I go, come on now, let's really look at your day. And they'll go, yeah, actually, I saw some pretty birds on the tree. I said, see, you weren't depressed. You popped out. See, we're always in and out. Is that making sense? Simple, simple, simple. So now when you have that tight feeling in your body, or you get a headache, sometimes, you know, you could be, you know, just caught up in something, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh man, you start to feel it. Well, what's really been going on is you've been in a ton of thought and you didn't know it, but your body knows it. How many, how many times are you profoundly tired, but you ignore it? Because we're so ahead in our mind, we don't realize how tired we are. How many of you have noticed a little tiredness since you've been going to this class today exhaustion and yesterday? Last night. Totally how, many, exhaustion. how many of you felt exhausted at the end of the day? That's a good song. Do you know why? You're detoxing off thought. You're detoxing. So you know how I work with uh, uh, people who are addicted to speed, methamphetamine? When they come off meth, they want to sleep for like three months. Because when you're on all the time, you, when you come off the drug, you're just exhausted. Well, when you're mentally geared up all the time, it keeps that cortisol, adrenaline, that's natural speed that you're operating from in your body. It's not a, it's not a good thing. And then when you start to just get present and get more relaxed, that's when your body says, I've been telling you for 20 years, you're really tired, and you start to feel it. And you're detoxing off all that adrenaline, all that thought. So if you feel profoundly tired, this is a good thing. That means you're shedding. You know how a dog sheds in the winter, in the summer? All the fur comes off? Well, all your thoughts are coming off. 
And after a while, it will, you'll come back to your natural energy. That's the good news. For a year, for, for about six months, I, was, I freaked out because I always felt tired. The more I got the principles, the more tired I got, the more tired I got. And I went to Roger, he was my mentor, I said, Roger, what's wrong with me? I, I, I'm exhausted. Sometimes I don't want to get out of bed. And he said, oh, you're detoxing. I said, well, what does that mean? He said, Kathy, you've been Zooming for how many years? You're coming off of it. He said, don't freak out. It's normal. So that's what I'd like to say to you. Don't freak out. It's normal. So now I honor when I'm tired. I honor it now. I don't override it. And then, don't you think, would you rather have natural energy or adrenaline energy? Which would you prefer? Natural. natural. And you get just as much done. Maybe you're tired this is just like tired thinking. That's it. That's what I'm saying. You're in tired thinking. No, maybe you're, you're not really, your body's not really tired. You're just thinking about sleeping and you could become tired from that. Um, um, Whatever. I'm just saying most of us are so geared up so much of the time and we're so used to it and we don't know how geared up we are until we come in for a landing. And when we come in, that's what happens at these conferences. You come in, how many of you have had these emotions come through? Where all these emotions are coming out of you. How many of you have had that? Because that happened to me also. See, when all this thought starts to, <coughs> starts to break up and come out, the emotions come with them. And to me, it's kind of like wisdom's cleaning house. You know, when you, when you go through your house and you clear the whole thing out, well, that's what's happening. How do you know your thoughts are breaking up? <coughs> Wait a minute. I hate that when I get a tickle in my throat. Say that again? First of all, I'm not really sure what you mean by thoughts breaking up, but if, if, if whatever it is, I don't know what's happening. I mean, what when you, you feel it. You feel it. You feel tired. Or you feel breaking up? Well, that's the term I use. Thought it, you, you know when I say you're geared up all the time? I wish I had something to write on. Uh, imagine just, just a bunch of thoughts crammed in all the time. After a while, that wears on you. It really does. And, 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 and the more geared up I am over time, it wears on my body. You, you, feel, you feel your thinking all the time, and it's, it, it becomes mentally exhausting. So when I say your thinking's breaking up, what I mean is you're, it's starting to come off you. It's starting to leave you. You're and not you, worried about it. Yeah, you're not worried about it. Yes? So two things I want to say. If I'm hearing you correctly, using the, um, the story with the guy in the car with the kids. Yes, yes. The story of the guy. The, 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 oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You were so in your thought and so oh, yeah. blinded by your thought and all the things that you were assessing about it that you couldn't even see somebody that you had spent time in a room with. There was no way to even see Yeah, them. that's a beautiful point. What she's saying is, when I was in, at the gas station, I was so annoyed, having so many annoying thoughts, I couldn't really see that it was a guy who had been in my class. You know, I, I just was seeing Kathy. Yeah, I, I was not, I, I was in the Kathy experience, not seeing who was, no. That, and that's, that's how the principles work. So I wasn't experiencing the van and who was in there. I was experiencing Kathy being annoyed at the music. And the second thing I was going to say to what you just said now, you know, I, everything, it's like, you're, I, you know, it's a constant choice, every minute, every second, every, you know. Every it's second. not a choice, it's just, it's, it's just happening. It's just, it's just you're so in thought. It's a choice of how you decide to. No, 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 no choice, no choice. No choice. It just is. Just is, okay. So then the last piece is, when you say the part about your head getting filled with the thoughts, the visual in my head is of a computer when it freezes. Beautiful, beautiful yeah. metaphor. Is that beautiful? Perfect? Shut so down. You're deleting Boom. the files. That's it. Okay. And then, you know, sometimes you can have a million windows. Like on my iPhone, I every now and then my son will go, Mom, you haven't been closing. I'm like, oh, you're right. So I'm like, close, 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 close. Yeah. We, we have a lot of windows open in our minds. And after a while, it bogs down the system. Beautiful metaphor. You got it. Yes. 
By me, as soon as I feel an emotion, I get tired. Okay, she's saying as soon as I feel an emotion, I get tired. Do you know how much thought <laughs> it takes to have these intense emotions? Think of the tallest building in New York City. The more, the, the badder you feel, the more exhausted you feel, is directly correlated to having that much thought, the tallest building in New York. So if you feel tired, you know, the emotions are coming through, just let them come through. But if we try to back them up or not experience them, it takes thought to hold thought, it takes thought to change thought, it takes thought to not want to have thought. We're literally creating more as opposed to, all right, it's coming through and you may get tired for a while. I was exhausted for six months. I cried a lot. I, I didn't know what was happening to me. Well, I was clearing out the system. Before learning that you're just tired. Well, because you're, you're in it. You're just in it. And you don't know. So you're going to see some interesting things. When you, all of you leave this conference after tomorrow, that's when things are going to start happening. Like some of you have had insights already, but even after, out of the blue, something will, you, you'll go, oh, that's what she was talking about. Because right now it may be kind of like, well, what is she talking about? That's fine. That's fine. That's why I say don't take notes, because this is an insight-based understanding. It's, it's not going to come from your head. It's going to come from your soul. Your soul's going to recognize it, because it knows it already. Yes? Is, first of all, is this okay that we're doing question and answer? Are you okay? Because I'm okay, but I want to make sure. Does everybody know the principle? I wasn't here yet, the principle. Okay, could you hold that? Just try to hang in there and listen, okay? Because I, 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 I want to address some of the questions. But if you listen, you'll pick up on it. Because no, I'm talking the principle on the uh, thing. That I'm talking about the principles now. I just talked about. Them. Yes. Yes. I'm saying that after the previous seminar, all I was doing was having thought storms instead of clearing up. I was like, what am I thinking? What? Yeah, I yeah. Thinking? So what she's saying is, after yesterday, she was having more thought storms of what am I thinking and what's going on. Well, you know what? That's normal. It was awareness. Yeah, you're, now you're aware of what's been going on all along. And you know what? Just be okay with that. Same thing happened to me. I didn't know if I was coming or going. <laughs> I, I went through a wacky phase, believe me. And during that phase, I was a psychotherapist, and, and I was a mom, and a wife, and all this stuff. And, but my mentor, he reassured me, you're fine. You're just going through your wacky stage. But you'll come out fine. And don't take it too seriously. And I love your smile. <laughs> I love your smile. Yes, sir. What, what about physical pain? You, you were, you're referring yes. to uh, pain like tension, headaches, or backaches, yes. or whatever. What if a person has an injury? Absolutely. Um, what about physical pain? What if somebody who has a real physical injury? And um, I have a colleague who had severe rheumatoid arthritis. Severe. And um, she started coming to my night class. She was also uh, extremely, she was alcoholic too. She was like a broken woman. Now, she could barely walk. I mean, she looked pretty bad. As she heard these principles over time, and I never talked about pain, she just heard them. And what she shared with me, because she just started to change, and she started to look healthy again. She, she literally almost like came back to life. And she said, I still have the pain. I have a different relationship to the pain. She saw how thought would exacerbate it. So she still had the arthritis, but her, her uh, symptoms or the pain itself, she noticed would change depending on where this is. She saw that. Another example, a woman attended my class. She was in right in front, right here. She had MS, and she was very young. She was only like 24, and very exaggerated, you know, symptoms. And so it took her five minutes to introduce herself. Uh, that's when I realized, oh, I need to get really present with her. 
So during that three-day training, you know, she was, you know, having, you know, she has MS. And she came back, we have a part one, part two, so she came back two, about two months later. She was in the front of the room. And I noticed her symptoms were not as extreme. She still had them, but they were. So during the break, I went up to her and I said, are you on a new medication? She says, no, I'm not on any medication. And I said, you're so different. She said, yeah, I'm not angry anymore. The anger, the anger left me. She was so angry that she had this. She was so young that she had it. When the anger left her, and she didn't work on it, it just left her, the symptoms came way down. Now, she still has MS, but her experience of MS changed. And so people who are dealing with whatever the physical issue is, when their minds start to relax and they start to get a sense of their own well-being, that has nothing to do with the physical, it does impact. But it doesn't take it away, it just, they're in a different place with it. Well, see, and I'm not saying thoughts create our pain or our injuries. What I'm saying is we do have this physical body. Right. We do. Now, my feet, my, I've been wearing the shoes and they do great for a while and then my feet start hurting. Now, until I had the thought my feet are hurting, my feet weren't hurting. As soon as I said, oh, my feet are hurting, I'm starting to feel my feet are hurting. See, it, it's, it's your experience of anything, your physical being, still has to come through thought. So I'm so glad you asked that question. I'm so glad you asked that question. And I've seen people, this woman with the rheumatoid arthritis, she really looked like a broken woman. And now if you saw her, she's the picture of health. And she teaches this to people who have chronic pain. Anyone who plays ball, I think pretty much gives the expert. You know, like you sprained your ankle, you broke your ankle, you're playing well. That's and it. Afterwards, it's like, oh, wow. Really That's nice. it. So athletes, they, they totally get this. When I talk about mind or wisdom, in the sports world, being in the zone, they know what that is. They have an injury, they don't know how bad it is till after. Yeah, same thing. See, wherever your mind is, that's what you're going to experience. And, and if your mind isn't, you know, if you don't have thoughts of pain, you will not experience pain. Remember in the Vietnam War, a lot of times they ran out of morphine, or even in World War II, they ran out of morphine. So then you know what the nurses would do? They would go to the soldier who's suffering, and, and they would sugar water. They would say, okay, you're getting your shot now, and they would give a shot of sugar water. And it would relieve the pain for a while. The soldiers with pain, they call that the placebo effect. In their mind, oh, I'm getting the morphine. Okay, great, she's putting the needle in. Okay, I'm getting the pain medication. So for a while, it relieves their pain. And the nurses came up with that because they wanted to help them hang in there while they were waiting for them. Do you see what I'm saying? This is very powerful. It's very powerful. And you've all experienced this already. This is not new. You all know this. Doesn't this make sense? It's not like this is something brand new. It rings true for everybody. So thank you for asking. Yes, sir. I, I can't hear you. Back to the prison examples. Yes. What do you do in a case where you suspect that the person is innocent? Oh. You know what? Oh, what do you do when I'm working with inmates in prison? What do I do if I suspect that they're innocent? Um, you know what? I can't, I can't get involved with that. Meaning, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, here's, here's what I do. Sometimes a guy will talk about, you know, I shouldn't be here, I shouldn't be here, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so, actually, I have a story about a guy who wasn't innocent. It's kind of a cute story. You want to hear it? Yeah. Yeah. A guy came into the class, and this is the tough guy class. And this guy comes in, he says, man, I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be here. And after the third time, I said, well, wh why shouldn't you be here? Well, they think I robbed a bank. And I said, okay. 
Well, did you rob a bank? Well, yes, I did rob the bank. And I said, well, then I don't understand. Why shouldn't you be here? Well, but they didn't catch me robbing the bank. And I'm like, oh, boy, got a live one in here. Even the other inmates are like, oh, boy, got a, got a live one. And so he was, in, you know, every week he'd, well, I shouldn't be here. I'm like, okay. Well, one day he comes up, up to me before class. I need to apologize. I said, why? Kathy, I can't believe this. I robbed a bank. <laughs> and I really did it. And I know now why I'm in here. He finally came to the planet. And I said, well, and he, oh, by the way, he's a businessman. No record, nothing. A businessman. I, I think he worked in a, some kind of electronic industry or whatever. I said, well, then why did you rob the bank? He said, Kathy, I was so stressed out. I didn't have enough money to pay the mortgage. I, I was so beyond stressed out. I was driving to work and I, it just came to me, I'm just going to go get the money out of the bank. He got caught. But again, he was so out there. He didn't think, you know, he knew he robbed the bank, but why should I be locked up? <laughs> so when a guy protests his, when he brings up his innocence, I tell them, listen, your wisdom is going to help you know where to go with that. And, and if you get connected to your wisdom, that's going to guide you as to what you can do to help yourself. And, and that, I think, does the more service, because I can never know for, for sure whether somebody's innocent. I, I can't know that. It's always the same approach. Yeah. Point them to their wisdom. And some guys who think they shouldn't be there, this other gentleman who's doing life without parole, same kind of story. He finally came to me and said, you know, I've been saying I should be here, but you know what? The fact that I was with that gang, was with the Crips, the fact that I was hanging out with them, that's why I'm here, and I should have known better. And he was in college, another one in college. So wisdom will help people out. Is the wisdom the mind that you're talking about? The what? The mind, the wisdom, the Jewish. Is that part of the power source? Well, yeah, intuition is just another word for wisdom yes, or that's mind. What I'm saying. It's part of that power mind. Uh, yes. Part of comes mind. straight from mind. Yeah. Okay. Now I understand. Okay. So it looks like our time is up. So this was fun.